Great to see all of you this morning. So many Bibles to two passages, John chapter 14 and Hebrews chapter 12. John chapter 14, verse 9. I want to read just two or three verses here and then go back to Hebrews 12 and I'll link it for us in a moment. Jesus is busy speaking to his disciples. Time is busy running out. He's about to get crucified. And um, he said in verse 29, he says in verse 21, uh, verse 29, John chapter 14, verse 29, he says this, I've told you now, before it happens, so that when it happens, you'll believe. He talks about his death, his resurrection. Then he says in verse 30, a very interesting thing. He says this, I will not speak with you much longer. For the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me. He's in line in your Bible. He has no hold on me. But the world must learn that I love the Father, that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Let's just quickly let's look at that. He's talking about the reality of Jesus dying on the cross. He's talking to his disciples about that. He says, guys, I'm going to have to die. I'm going to have to get up against that cross. Because unless I die, we cannot be united. The world is living in death. And unless I die, we cannot get united. But if I die on that cross, and I get united with you in that cross, and I go through three days of hell, pain and suffering, after three days, when I get raised to life, guess what? Because we are united, you are raised with me. Says Satan is coming. So the enemy is coming for Jesus. He knows he's coming. He says, But I can guarantee you this. He is going to find nothing against my account that's going to make it impossible for me to fulfill my inheritance. It's quite something, isn't it? I mean, you think about just obviously, man, he's God. Friends, in this context, he's not talking about him being God. He's talking as his life as a man blameless before God. There's some difficult times coming for Jesus. He's saying, listen, Satan has nothing on me. Then let's turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Because these writers of the book of Hebrews, they have done their best for 12 chapters now to encourage Jewish believers who believe in Jesus. They've been through a bit of shaking. They've had some stuff happen to them that's not so nice. And they're in a place where they're thinking, you know, this, this Jesus fellow, I don't know. I don't know if he's really got the answers. I don't know if it really, if he's the guy that has got all the answers. I don't know if I shouldn't just go back into mixing a bit of my Jewish background and just do a little bit of this and mix in a little bit of the Hebraic roots and then get back to that and see if somehow I cannot make my own plan. So these, these writers are now writing and they, they're writing chapter 12 to leave you with two encouragements. See if you can find them with me this morning. They're a little bit hidden. See if you can pick up the two encouragements that these writers are now busy concluding this book with. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. So therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, whose witnesses, Hebrews 11, all those heroes of faith, that have died, they're all with Jesus, they're looking at your life, they can see everything in the spirit of what's happening around your life. It says, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him 
who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, please don't align. Don't know if that is a in your life. You're struggling with sin. Please don't align. If you don't have a Bible, bring it with next week with a pen. Then you can underline in your Bible as well. I'm going to help you this morning on how to win the fight against the struggle of sin. Amen. Would you like to know that? Amen. The struggle against sin, you've not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you've forgotten that word encouragement that addresses you as sins. A son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves. And he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. In pure hardship, as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you're not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers discipline us for a little while, as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. Please in the line. In the line in verse 9, the father of our spirits, through Jesus, God has become your father. He's the father of your spirit. And it says in verse 10, God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Please in the line. He's online. God, your Father, wants to train you. He's busy training you. We're going to find out in a moment how. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Make every effort to live in peace with all men to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God, and that no other root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral. Or as God is like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the old son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He could not bring about no change of mind, though he saw the blessing with tears. You've not come to a mountain that can be touched, this burn with fire, with darkness, gloom, a storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them, because they could not bear what was commanded. But it got commanded. It says, if an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. Do you come to Mount Zion there, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God? You've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. To the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You've come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men, made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to sprinkle blood that speaks a better word than blood of Abel. See to it that you not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more, I will shake not only the earth but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken that has created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Father, there's much in this portion of Scripture. There's much on your heart this morning. That you long for your sons to walk in. Therefore, I ask you for the grace and the enabling of your spirit to, to make things simple, to make things plain, to make things clear. That we can be hearers of the word this morning and also leave this meeting and go and do it. So I ask you for your presence. My mind, my voice, my body. I ask for your presence on every heart. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Who's got a young baby in the meeting? Yay. Jax, can you help me? Jima, Ria, Jackie, Kutho, Chigwa. 
So there's an encouragement in Hebrews chapter 12 for when it gets rough. You're going to have to get on the stuff, please. Yeah? Please get on the stuff and then help your wife around. Thank you. Okay. Let's just see if what I'm about to tell you is true. What is your favorite position to hold your daughter? Mom. On your hip. Okay. And when she was younger? Aha, okay. Help me with your daughter's name again. I'm so sorry. The little one? Zali. Pass to that, please. Rian. What is, what is your favorite position to hold Zali? Even now she's getting bigger. And when she was way smaller? Is it possible that you ever turned her out? To carry her within your arms like that? Did you ever carry her like that as a baby? Why do you think a mother will keep that baby as close as possible and a dad says, no, 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 it's disco time. Come, let me show you the world. But you're safe. Am I right? You guys have been outstanding. Bless you. Let's listen. What the writers of the book of Hebrews are trying to get across to you is God is your father. When it gets rough, when it gets tough, he got you in his arms, but he turned you out and he wants you to stop to face life. He wants to train you. He wants to get you out of the nappies and get you mature. And the first encouragement that is in the book of Hebrews and in this chapter, at the top is when it gets rough, praise God, he's busy showing you that he's very personally involved in your life. Amen. What a blessing. Amen. I don't want to repeat what we preached, I think, three weeks ago. Some of you will say, yeah, but what's the encouragement in here? The second encouragement of the book of Hebrews chapter 12 specifically is that come now, God is now going to train you. He's got you, you're safe. Now he wants to train you. He wants to impart certain things to you. He wants to help you. He wants to mature you. Because a mature son of God, according to Romans chapter 8, is a son or daughter that knows how to deal with sin with the help of the Spirit. So this whole second encouragement is like, Woo-hoo! When it gets tough, when there's suffering, when there's hardships, when things doesn't work out, get excited with God. Amen. You've got Him as Father, and if you will allow Him and come to Him, you will learn how to legislate with love. I want to talk to you this morning about legislating and love, learning how to legislate with love. The gospel says you are united with Jesus in death, united with him in life. Where is Jesus seated now? Jeep seat? Are you happy that he's seated in heaven? Yes. Ephesians chapter 1 says you are seated with him. Yes. So what are you doing there? Taking a snore? No. He wants to teach you how to use authority. He wants to teach you how to deal with sin. He wants to teach you how to legislate things in the spirit so that they can manifest and change the earth. Amen. Amen. Anyone that's keen... Do you want to hear about that this morning? This other church, are you awake? Do you know that you're a church? It's just gone 1045? Yeah. Are you here? Awesome. See, the encouragement of Hebrews 12 is like, hey, I know it's tough. But if you will come to God, your Father, He will train you. He will teach you how to war. He will teach you how to get things done in the Spirit. So things will start to look different on the earth. Isn't that what Jesus said his church would do, Matthew 16? He says, the ecclesia called out once. They will do some crazy things. They will bind things on the earth that will be bound in heaven. Or they will loosen things on the earth that will be loosened in heaven. How? Through this process. So who's keen to learn to legislate? At the side of the church, I I think we're there. I'm, I'm asking a question more intently for the guys that are not a disco, not dodging. Do you want to know? Okay, maybe we'll converse you halfway through. If you want to learn, then write this efficient for legislate. I took a look at Afrikaans Bursian. And I have to represent God truthfully. So I can't come and tell something means something and it doesn't mean that something. Legislate. What does it mean to legislate? Here's a definition for you. To bring about changes by putting, into, by putting law into practice.
Legislate what has been legislated. To bring about changes, putting law into practice. That's what it means to legislate. You want to change something, you get the government to give you the laws on that thing, and when the government is giving you the laws, you can go. Effect change. When do you take occupation of your house when you bought your house? When do you do it? You have to sign for it. They have to see everything in place. When the paperwork is in place, they say, sir, everything's done. You can now go and change 34 Western Park Street just the way you've always rent. Yeah. Up until that point, you are, 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 are renting this unit. The agreement of the law says you have to do such and such and such and such. This is what the owner says, such and such and such and such. But the day that you have the papers in your hand, we ask permission for no one on where we want to break at walls. Never mind, put in yes. a nail. Yes. We okay? That's what it means to legislate. You've been legislated. It is your property. Now you can bring the change. I want to teach you this morning how to learn to legislate with God's love. Happy to go. Go for it. If you're going to learn to legislate, you have to understand that legislation requires a place. Legislation or governments is exercised from a place. Let's see what the place is that you've been invited to to exercise governance from, to bring change from. Verse 18 says, You've not come to to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it beg that no further word be spoken to them. Verse 22, But you've come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You've come to God, the judge of all men. What's the encouragement? The encouragement is this, guys, get this. You've come to God's own courthouse. You've got access. Mount Sinai was where governance was introduced. Remember when Moses took the Israelites out way, 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 way back in the story. Exodus 19, Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb. The mountain is shaking. The earth is quaking. There's fire. There's lightning. There's thunderstorms. Moses says, Oh, fast my brook, my bas bange. God says, Be very careful. You touch anything out of line, I smack you dead on spot. It's like, Wow, God's angry today. He says, no, no, he's not. What's God doing? He's establishing his governance. He's saying, so you know who I am. I'm holy. But my governance is governance that operates by love. Therefore, I give you the Ten Commandments, the law. Moses, uh, these rites says, praise the Lord. We're not in that part of the story anymore. God has established his government. Mount Sinai was all about getting people to say, I will fear the Lord so much, I will, dis- I will not disobey him ever. These writers are saying, but thank the Lord, you're not there. You're not at Mount Sinai because of the fullness of Jesus' and sacrifice. Now we can come to a place where, where the governance of God can be enforced. It's established, Jesus fulfilled, and now... We're in a place where governance can be enforced. You're in a place where you can now bring change to your life. You can take this law of love and you can apply it to your life and you can come to the place where with the word and with the spirit, you can affect change to your life, your marriage, your children, the children's children, generations before them, generations after. You're the one. You've come God's courtroom. You can now learn to legislate. You can now learn to bring change. I know it's pretty awful where you're sitting. I know that your relationships are stinking. Your money even more so if you can find them. But come now. You're in a place where we can change all that. What an encouragement. He's not inviting you to the base church on Sunday morning. He's inviting you to heaven self. He's inviting you to the place where you are registered. Can I describe the place for you? Want to know about this place? I know you won't. 
You want to know about this place? Oh. It says Mount Zion. It is the ultimate authority. Jews understood when you took mountain in spiritual language, it's talking a, a spiritual authority. This is, this is proper. There's no authority like the authority that lives on Mount Zion. Good place to come. The heavenly Jerusalem. So, so what we have on the earth is a little picture, but I bet it's glorious. It says it's the, the city of the living God. Who are your cities? What's your favorite city at back, man, in the world? Get down. Any place you got roots there? Were you born there? Not? Okay. Any city outside of South Africa? Paris. Woohoo! hoo Any other city? Portugal. Porto. Porto. Portugal. Anyone else? Roma. In the Gaboni. Awesome. Can I tell you, friends, the reason you're drawn to cities is because your destination one day is the city of a living God. But you've not seen a city like that yet on this earth. Go read the book of Revelation 19, 20. It describes the foundation. It's got 12 foundations of different cut stones. So that when the light who is God comes onto it, it just radiates light everywhere. New York looks foul in comparison. That's a place you come to. I mean, all of a sudden, all the cities of South Africa pale in comparison. I want to there, rather. He says, it's the city of the living God. Everything there lives. There's nothing there. Even the grass vibrates and resonates with sound and life at a certain frequency. There's nothing dead. It's not like driving through West Rand. It's like, whoa, yeah, what happened? Yeah. There's no life here. Everything is alive. That's the place you come to. But so that you don't miss it, he says, you come to a place where there's thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. That's the place. Now, please, in your Bible, underline the word joyful. Because here's what these guys are doing. They are beholding God. And all they can do is say, holy, holy, holy. I'm so sorry. I get so excited. I just want to preach, but I have to get down a little bit. My voice doesn't want to, don't want to go there completely this morning. All they can do is holy, holy, holy. And they say it with a smile. Imagine what they're seeing. It's, it's a so transforming of their lives. All they do, you know, they've been assigned to declare holiness to the Lord and to serve you. You know that. That is the job descriptions. All they do morning, noon, and night is glorify Him and at His command, come and serve you. Unless you learn to invite them in. Imagine getting up. If you sleep, sleep doesn't seem to be guaranteed there. There are a workforce of not. Six o'clock, there's no breakfast time. You get to attention and you start clearing holy, holy, holy. Nine o'clock, there's no tea time or breakfast. It's like, hey, yesterday, can I need a bit of robot crying, They go past lunch. The pre meeting doesn't stop. Then they look at you sitting down with your family to eat. It's like, they don't do that. They are joyful. Because they're in a place where they know this is the ultimate authority. This is life. We are representing the one who is awesome. And we legislate, we enforce from this place. Some of you, all of you have got angels. Got an angel in heaven representing you. Some of your angels are so bored. Could you just like, pray to Jesus. They're waiting. They've been assigned. You can mobilize them with your prayers. If you know how to legislate. You know that you've got access. 
So the place we come to is a play of joy. So we need to learn to legislate for laughter. You have to learn how to legislate for laughter. It's one of the first giveaways that maybe, maybe, your father is wanting to train you to say, come now, my boy, come sit with me. Let me teach you. If there's no joy in your life, if laughter is a seldom occurrence and it rains when it happens, you have to learn to legislate for it. Everything about God is full of joy. Everything about God. The place you come to is a joyful place. Anyone this morning saying, I need to learn to legislate this morning. My joy levels is a little bit Low. You know the Americans are stepped into this. Eh? If you go in, in America, you, you buy a normal burger. You can upsize that meal. I think first one is small, regular meal. That is already a large meal in South Africa. Then you go large. Then you can go extra large. And I think you can then go super size. They try to get hooked onto this principle. God is saying, I know life is shaking. I know things are not nice. I'm trying to supersize you. I'm going to upgrade you. Come now, this thing is yours. Come learn from me. And let's teach you how to do them. What is your first response when it goes tough? Where are you? What are you doing? You say you're good, but what about this? What about that? What about this? What about that? Instead of saying, Father... Wow, my life is broken. My life is a mess. In this area, your word says this. I do not see that, Father. I do not want to do it. I come to you, Father. Please, let me learn how to legislate with love. You okay? I want to show you what gets given at Mount Sinai. We're back way, 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 way back. What gets given? The Ten Commandments. What are the Ten Commandments? If you have to break them down real rough, what is the Ten Commandments about? Love. You must obey and love. Happy? In essence. The first broad category that you have to learn to love is who? God. How? How? The Jew that came out of slavery in Exodus chapter 19. How did he learn to love God? What must he not do? Worship other idols. Is your Bible the same? So don't go make idol figurines. Don't go make other things and they say, well, he's so powerful, they brought us out. Two, three, four chapters later, what's the very first thing the Israelites do? Oh. This calf has brought me out. Now we say, shame on you, scatter. So let's fast forward, 2024. How do you worship idols today? Very simple. You keep your opinion above God's. I don't like it when the boss says that. I'm just going to do my thing. Oh, no, I must be part of it. My life's stinky. It's sweaty there on Sundays. And they've got issues. They're all with rape. No, that doesn't work for me. Honey, what? Ah, oh, man. So we look at these guys and say, they're clueless. What can you be thinking? The calf clearly didn't bring out. Yet we come here sophisticated. Now we push with the glasses. Now I gotta say, what are you doing? You worship your opinion. You just created an idol. And the law of love cannot be used against you. What's the second big commandment out of ten? We have to do to others? Love one another. How did a Jew love another in his time? Because they went for Rari, so they said, God says, don't look at their donkey. Don't get lustful after his donkey. He says, die long walk over there say, throw it. Don't do that. Don't kill his servants. Because if you love someone, you look after that someone. You sacrificially serve and protect that someone. What does it look like all the way here? And yesterday, that act is full of stuff. In here, whoo, my brother, I've got the bed for no side that checks out all the daughters of these rake uncles. Never will I sleep with them. What does it look like? This side of the story. To love for a slave to... to to love himself. What is, what is that in the Ten Commandments? Take a day of rest. I mean, he was trying to get it into their skulls for slaves to start to live free. Just take one day of rest. Do you know, 2020, 20, 24, and we're still like, no, nah, that's not part to me, the Lord. Like, hey, boring. What does it look like? 
2024 to find rest. Take a day. Please take a day. At least a day. But you know how you learn to love yourself? You get agreement with what God is busy speaking over you. What is God saying over you? The reason you can't love yourself is you are constantly fighting God. You can't get rest. It doesn't matter how many days you take. You see, when God gave the Ten Commands, it wasn't just an interesting story that was like, okay, now the story is gone. Let's, let's leave it. No, no, no. What God was introducing, He's introducing to you and me the way His governmental system works. He governs through love. And He wants to teach you, if you want to have governance and authority, you're going to have to learn to come to the place where His love can transform you so that you can go out and bring chance to others. It's difficult for us to love ourselves, eh? Especially if you've got a bit of a spicy past. Stuff you've done. It's things we've done against you. But you get to understand that you're coming to a place where there's so much joy waiting for you. But it's not automatic. It's not automatic. You're going to have to learn to legislate from place where God works it out. We're going to learn to legislate. We have to learn that legislation has a process. Before the bull ye comes knocking at your door. Any, oh, no, don't raise your hand. I think some of us have been there. Stand up. Before they knock on your door to say, come, we're we closing shop here. They have followed a process. Let me just get there. It's a warning, 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 warning. I don't know how many warnings. But the point I'm trying to make is there's a process. I want you to see the process that you come to, God's process, when he teaches you how to legislate. It says this, in verse 24, you've come to God, the judge of all men. Do the spirits of righteous men made perfect. To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to sprinkled blood, that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it, that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they do not escape and they refuse him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away him who warns us from heaven? So what you find there is the process of how God's government works. How does, how does legislation work? First thing he says, that God is the judge of all men. Now, now stay with me. Last time we heard God is a father. But now you're telling me God is a judge. So is God confused? Is he schizophrenic? What's up in the morning saying to die, I'm angry to die, I'm flipping, sorting out the whole world? He's not. That's why we took time to describe to you the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is a man that's full of love. But his love also comes with truth. He's the Father of truth. In certain moments that as a father, I have to bring truth to my boy, does it make me an illegitimate father now? Do I love my boy less? No. As a matter of fact, I have to bring the truth. Because I have to judge your characters. I might, that thing, mm -mm -mm, that is not who you are. So let's bend that thing out of the way. How? There's only one eye. When they're young. You discipline them. You don't break them. You don't abuse them. You discipline them. So what he's saying is you're coming to God as a judge. How does God judge your life? Number one, he judges your righteousness. Please take notes. This is going to help change your life. Some of you are looking at me like a granite block. It's like, okay, see if you can roll me over. I'm not trying to. I'm trying to help. Aren't you, aren't you tired of going around the same old thing again and again and again? Every Friday night there's an alcohol problem. Every Saturday morning, it bothers us. Nothing changes. He judges, your, he judges your righteousness. The process starts there. Now I've got an incredible news for you. When you got united with Jesus on the cross, when he died and you got united with him in death, you were united with him in life. You united him in him right now. 
which means you are united in his righteousness. Let me say that slowly again. Because you got united with Christ at the cross, guess whose righteousness does your heavenly Father see when he judges your life? You don't know what goodness is yet. Because you got united with Jesus in death and life. And you are now his righteousness. Whenever God the Father judges your life, he can find no reason or no obstacle that will keep you from having access to him. Is this, you can never lose access to God as a father. Happy? Unless you think a little bit of myself, you know, a little bit of my self-effort, my self-righteousness, man, let me really appraise God. Self-righteousness. Or you think, ugh, stuff the whole lot, man. I'll just do what I want to do. If he is so loving, he'll just grab me in time before I die. Well, okay, good luck for you. Might end a little bit different than what you think. It's unrighteousness, like, I don't want anything to do with him. I don't want to love no one. I don't want to love God. I want to love myself. Just keep on abusing me. It will affect your Liberty to come to God the Father, but your righteousness, if you believe in Jesus, your righteousness enables His righteousness given to you. His righteousness ensures you've got access 24-7. It means you can come to this place, the courthouse, anytime you want. Cool. Anytime. You can come to legislate. Second way, process, as He measures your blamelessness, are you perfect? He's a father, a judge. Of the spirit of righteous men made perfect. Did the Bible say that? So let's measure your perfection this morning. Based on the law of love. How perfect is your love towards God this morning? Well, you've got all these idols and opinions that are like, hey, he's but you can't be in a rock. Let's measure it. Because heaven does. Let's measure your love towards, let's start your wife or your children. Or this body. Let's just measure that. Because perfection, the example we've seen, is you lay your life down to serve them with everything, even when they take cheap shots at you. Oh, you know, I don't like church that much. I want to do that. I got so hurt in church. My church will just burn you. It's possible. I'm sorry if we've done it. I'm sorry that we probably will do it. But somewhere along the line, you choose to take offense. Offense is never given. It's taken. But how perfect is your love towards those sitting next to you this morning? And think about the color and worry about his skin. And think about their banking, banking income, bank statements. Yeah. Lastly, let's measure the love towards yourself. How, how, how perfect are you this morning? Hey. Is it 10 out of 10? No. See, here's the thing. Righteousness determines your access. Jesus determines your access. But your obedience determines your blamelessness. Are we okay? Your obedience to what God says, love me as the only God in your life. Love as sacrificial. He doesn't matter what they do to you. Keep loving and start to agree with what I say about you, even if everyone else says something different. God says, now, now that you've learned to love like I love, you're perfect. Happiness? Here's the sad news for you. Who's the one that blames on a consistent basis? The side of the church, are you sure about that or are you settled? Who's the one that's constantly blaming, constantly accusing? Anyone? Satan. <laughs> so it goes like this. Even the story of Job will tell you this. Because people say, oh yeah, but God gave him permission, man. I mean, there he was appearing before God and God said, yeah, okay, go. Read your Bible, please. What was Job doing? Before that whole entourage of Satan's presence went into heaven. What was Job doing? He was doing a self-righteous act. Saying, I've got the sphere. I don't think he will protect me. Let me be sacrificed on behalf of my children. Who do you think was standing there? That one. <laughs> Take a little note. We don't have to worry now. Just, we'll get time. What is the accused doing with your life? He knows he cannot prevent your access to the Father, but he knows this, I can prevent them from walking to fullness. 
I must just get enough accusation against them, present it before the Father, because here's the thing about God, He's also a judge. And He said this, He exalts His word above His name. His law works on love. If He wants to bless them, but these things are in a way, we do. And here's what they will do. They'll turn to Him and say, where are you? So what does He do? Okay, let's watch a uh, demon and a demonic. Let's just measure. Ooh, oh, the first law, love God. Ooh, pride, opinions. Ooh, scrape, scrape. Check and say, like, come on, how does he love people? Oh, no, no. Oh, that abuse? Oh, guys, we've set up that sexual assault towards that man in his young, young years. But then he's still got paternity. He still has it forgiven. Scrape, boys. Get it down. Must love himself? No, 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 no. We'll cause so much confusion in his life that he'll think he's worthless and useless. Just write down, there's no agreement with what God says about his life. And just put it in there, we'll get a chance. And he's not intimidated to rush to get them out. He just waits. Especially if you're fluttering around. Just take notes. I want to serve Jesus. Then there's a day where the Spirit of the Lord touches you and like, I'm going to tell the whole world about Jesus. So he says, ooh, boy, sing those lips. I was being slipped from the mirror. God? X, Y, Z. Exhibit 1, 2, 3. You cannot. Hardships. Suffering. Lack. Patterns of cycles. Patterns of cycles. Set. You see, to be blameless is to be obedient. To be blameless is not to have a position of righteousness. You can access God, but you are walking now. When you're blameless, you are walking in the way of righteousness. God will bless righteousness. He will bless you when you walk in the way of righteousness. He will bless your marriage. He will bless your finances. He will bless your children. He will bless your business. And you're not going to give it to Him because you want to bless. You want to give because you want to live before Him in obedience. Your righteousness gets judged. Secondly, your blamelessness. Good news, your righteousness, you believe in Jesus? Got access to God. Settle that. It's not on the question. When Ephesians speaks about the fact that in Christ we are holy, blameless, free from accusation, it's talking about this relationship with God as a Father. It's not about now to highlight how the enemy comes to try and build accusation against you. Okay? third part of the process is the love Jesus has to get applied. That's the process. Righteousness, blamelessness, and blood has to be applied. That's the process of God. That's how he wants you to learn to govern. How interesting in the story is that there's a blood reference to help you understand this application of blood. So we've got righteousness. Do you know that you've got access to Christ always? Yes. Uh, to, to God as a father because of Christ? You happy about that? You happy about that? Quickly stand. See, some of you are sort of happy, you're slow to get to your feet. Okay. Give your wife a squeeze. Kiss on a cheek. Oh, we're practicing love. <laughs> Wonderful being made perfect. Wonderful. Maybe stretch your brains a little bit if you need. ITB, whichever part of you is a little bit stiff, go back. Okay, grab a seat. <clears throat> Look at what it says here. Verse 24, to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant. So, come to Jesus. Righteousness, is he blameless? Just put on this thing. But then the blood has to be applied. There's the process of God. Listen to this incredible example now. It says, to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Do you remember the story of Cain and Abel? What happened there? Let's ask this side. What happened to the story of Cain and Abel? Someone is doing less, but I cannot hear a thing. <laughs> but if I remember the story correctly, Abel was walking in the way of righteousness. He was making a living in the way of righteousness, and what he received from the Lord in his, in his return, he would offer to the Lord, say, because you bless me and because of your righteousness, I come, my, my expression of faith in the way of righteousness, will you accept my life? God says, bless you. Cain, it's like, no, 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 I'll make my plans. 
I'll weigh, walk in the way of the wicked and I'll, I'll get to God and I'll just, he must just be blessed with what I give him. Then God turns down Cain's offering and what happens to Cain? He drops his lip. He's very unhappy. Because he wants to do what he wants, how he wants it, spend his money the way he wants it and just, just include God in it. God says, no, you don't understand that. I, don't, I bless righteousness. I bless those who by faith live in righteousness. Your offer is not acceptable, but you can also do what Abel did. You also have an opportunity. What does Cain decide to do? No, drop my lip, now I'll climb the tree. How can you bless him? I don't have it, I will not have it, and Cain killed Abel. That's amazing. It's amazing that in Hebrews 12, it says the blood of Abel still cries out. Why? Why is the blood of Abel still crying out? Well, let me ask it this way for you. What do you think the blood of Abel is crying for? Come, you said it. Justice. Revenge. Who's going to revenge me? Who's going to avenge me? Who's going to avenge me? Who's going to sort me out? This thing has happened to me. I was innocent. I was loving God with everything I had. Who's going to do something about that in my family line? It says the blood of Abel still speaks. Go with me in preaching analogy this morning. No one in Abel's line has yet stood up to say we will have the blood of Jesus on that. Jewish teaching talks about the reality of generational blood, generational curse. And so what the, the writers of the book of Hebrews is introducing, are introducing to us that we don't even see is that even the generational stuff that stands against you must be applied, silenced with the blood of Jesus. No, no, but Jesus did it all, man. I'm happy. I'm going to heaven. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, Jesus has done it all. Have you applied it all? Have you looked at these patterns in your life and think, Lord, for the life of me, I don't know where they come from. How can it be? Have you ever thought that in everything Jesus has won, he's left the blood, his blood for you, to by faith go and apply it to close certain doors, to deal with certain generational curses, so that the blood of Jesus... And bring generational unlocking and inheritance to you. Amen. Jesus is that all. But our Western minds are like, ooh, me, wah, me, Mickey. Now it's getting weird. How joyful are you? How free are you? You decide. Then there's a fourth, the last one of the process. God warns you. He warns you. The process of how God judges is, is their righteousness. If you're not born again, you're not righteous, I can't help. He's making his decisions. If you believe in Jesus, you're righteous, but how blessed are you? How perfect are you in love? See, Paul says this, your faith is only seen through love. Do you love God? Do you love others or do you love yourself? That is where no accusation can be held against you. Remember we read about Jesus' life? The enemy could find nothing in Jesus' life. It was blameless. It was not a thing that the enemy could write down in 33 and a half years of Jesus' life and said, oh, he doesn't love God the Father there. He didn't love people there. I didn't agree with himself in terms of what God was saying about his life. Nothing. Then there had to be blood applied. It's only the blood of Jesus that will silence those accusations. Fourthly, how do you know about it? How do you know? So you'll get warned from heaven. The Holy Spirit will come to you. So listen, in your finance, be honest. There's something there. Now, now I, I have a decision to make. I'm going to heed the warning or I'm going to walk into the chaos. Whose fault is that? God's fault? Or my own? Does he want to bless me? Has he provided everything for my blessing? He says he will warn you. He says when his voice comes to you, do not refuse that voice. Yeah, but Jana says, yeah, you don't know my life. I, I, I probably don't. But I, I know this. Because of Jesus, you've received the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit of God searches all things. The stuff of people that has gone for, He knows. 
The stuff that's been happening in your life right now, He knows. The stuff that's going to come, He knows. The issue is not that He does not know, and the issue is not that He's not speaking. The issue is you refusing to say, nah, it's not relevant for me. Thank you very much. Are we okay, friends? But a couple of testimonies, but they are so wild. I couldn't even tell them to my family. But let me tell a nice one, a, decent, a recent one, not a decent one. Let's see if the others are undecent. December, we had, the, we had benefit first time. The three of us, my brother, my sister, and myself, we stayed under the same roof and the same holiday. It's a blessing that is a generational blessing that has been passed down to us. What a blessing. And it's the first time in seven years that we got to stay under the same roof. The first night we stay in the, in the, or sleep in different parts of the house, but we are together as a family. So it gives me a dream. But the dream is of sexual immorality that, that, that is so vulgar that by the time I wake up, I think to myself, how can I still be in misery with all that, as I, that I've done? That's the impression. There's a lot of detail in it. And I ponder on this thing for two days. I, I, I'm like, I am shocked. I, I don't know what to, to make of it, and it's not like I'm getting clarity on it. But as we sat together the second, third evening we were together, I thought to share with my siblings. Guys, I believe what the Lord showed me is there's a generational thing that has been coming through our family line of sexual immorality. Stuff, we all have had different exposures to that, but it's way before us, way before we knew there's certain stuff. And these things that we tonight have to just make right with the Lord. How do you make right with the Lord? Confess, say, Lord, the warning has come. It's true. If you resist the warning, good luck. But the warning has come. The Lord is warning. There's blessing. There's things he wants to unlock around us, but he can't because of sexual immorality. Stuff that's not in the light. It's not applied. It's not uh, uh, being full to the blood of Jesus. So we sit together and we pray to this thing. There's things my sister feels. We have an open conversation. Now you, you try and have that with your families. If the Lord highlights those things. Just that in itself is a miracle. Do you have family that sort of believes with you that you can have the same conversation? So we have to, we get conversation. Long story short, we pray on it and we feel this stuff to work out and we do that. So the Lord leads us. <clears throat> By the end of December, let me say, for as long as we've had that property, we've tried our best to try and rent into a rental market. It can just at least help us cover the cost. It's just a simple thing to do. So we have to, every month, we're paying money into trying to enjoy this thing. It's not a blessing. It is given a blessing, but it's weighing financially. By the end of December, so this happens just before Christmas, end of December, the Lord connects us with people that for the first time now are positioned in the market to get a tenant that will rent this thing on a consistent basis where the financial needs to service the property and to create a bit of maintenance is now in place. Please hear me, I'm not trying here to brag, and I'm not trying to say, here's a shortcut to blessings. What is this about? This is about you getting your worship acceptable to God. Amen. There's a certain way he wants his son, his sons and his daughters to operate on the earth. He wants to walk with the Spirit. He wants you to walk with the Spirit, that you can change things. Bring change to your life. You can't be 70 with one foot to the grave and one foot still of this side thinking, I'm going to decide whether I'm going to lift my hands Sunday morning. But time is running out. He wants to get to the place where you can start to affect change in your life and in people around you, your family, generations behind you. I believe we're silent because it's hitting. It's hitting us this morning. Some people use it as a formula to get blessing. Right? If you're here this morning and you're doing that, bless you. I just want to tell you, you have a father and he's concerned about your maturity. Your formula at some point is going to crash. Just don't get angry with him. What I've described to you this morning is the benefit of walking with the Spirit. Why? Because you want your wish to be acceptable. You okay? There's two men in the story. Two men. The one had no life of worship. His name was Esau. You know why? Because he was ungrateful in his heart. Took the privileges of birthright. Like, yeah, whatever. If you want your worship to be acceptable this morning, learn to live with utter gratitude. Thank Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and your Heavenly Father for the fact that you are so favored and loved. 
gratitude, Amen. acceptable worship. Amen. There's another man in the story. His name is Caleb. Uh, Caleb, Caleb, Abel. I'm going to finish preaching now. His name is Abel. He's still waiting for someone to silence the blood. Don't be reluctant, my friends. How do you get accept- acceptable worship? Learn to obey the Lord. Learn to love God. Learn to love others. Learn to love yourself. How? The help of the Holy Spirit. The truth and the help of the Holy Spirit. Are we okay? Ingratitude and justification make your worship unacceptable. I'm grateful. And if you're justifying everything, it's not acceptable worship. You got access, but don't have acceleration. So it's quite a word, isn't it? If there's any aspect of this word this morning that you have to respond to. If you're here this morning and you're not righteous, ask the man to come. You, you've not been born again. You can't say this morning, I could go to God as a father because of the righteousness of Jesus, but you want that. That's this morning. Please quickly just say So you're here this morning and you say, hey, thank you for the righteousness, but blamelessness. There's a couple of things I have to allow this morning. A couple of things I reckon I've given him that can maybe touch me. That's you this morning. And here's the thing. You've received warning. I've neglected this. I'm neglecting a lot of the Spirit's moving. You've received warning. You're not applying a formula. You're walking with a friend and the Holy Spirit says, come now. Stand up. Deal with these things. Love you. Please get to your feet. That's you this morning. Just come real quick. Awesome. 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 God is so good, friends. He's here. He's present. Ask those standing. I'd love to lay hands on you. Would you mind just to join me in the front? You can join me. I'd love to just lay hands on you. No, it's challenging. No, it's very challenging. But I tell you, it's so freeing. It's so freeing. Because you do, you're trading your faith already. It's like coming. Awesome. 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 Can I fill in, guys? This is why I say You guys are standing on the front. Before I lay hand on you, I want you to confess. Repent. Apply the blood of Jesus. Whatever it is. Just do that. Just, just agree with me. He's coming to this morning. He's saying, okay, that's true. Just confess and say it's true, Lord. This warning, this thing in my life, I pray before this morning, I repent. I ask for the blood of Jesus to wash that thing off. Just wherever you guys at, whatever the issue is, no one wants to know. It's you and the Lord. So close your eyes for a moment dealing with something specific that was highlighting for you. That's it. That's it. Then apply the blood. How do we do that? Just say, Lord, thank you for the blood of Jesus that washes me clean from this from this accusation. Okay. Then once you've done that, I want you just to enjoy God. If you can, preferably don't be linking with one another. There's individual moments that the Lord is wanting to touch and just have power. I ask the leaders to come and help me in a moment, but would you mind staying with me? I trust that you've been equipped this morning. I trust that you can go home and say, Man, I'm going to ask some different questions. Can I just say, once you get to deal with this thing properly, whatever it is, within 48 hours, stuff shift. So for those of us that are standing here this morning, please have a look at me real quick again. Whatever you've brought before the Lord this morning, that thing doesn't shift within 48 hours that you brought before Him this morning. Then ask the Lord again. Then you might have something of the truth, but not the whole thing pulled. Is that okay? It might be a bit deeper than what you are seeing this morning. Don't get discouraged. Just measure. 48 hours, shift dramatically. You know, you praise Jesus. You let us know Tuesday night. 
not you just ask him. It's a fellowship invitation. It's not a formula. You okay? I'm going to hand the meeting back to uh, was Mark. To Mark. Let's bless you. See you Tuesday night. But please, if we worship, we go. Let's just be mindful of these men and women that's responding to him as he must bless you.